Hi, my name is Mark Pepin. I'm a UAB medical student. This is Erin Dorman, and she'll be assisting me in teaching you guys the cardiovascular exam. Now, before you begin the exam, it's important that you make sure you have what you need to complete it. So what I have with me here is a pen light. I also have a straight edge, which is actually just a tongue depressor, which you can find in the rooms. And then I also have a ruler with centimeters labeled on it. And the last thing I have, as far as equipment goes, is a stethoscope with both the bell and the diaphragm available for me to assess heart sounds. Okay, so the first thing you want to do when you're starting the cardiovascular exam is to position the patient appropriately on the table. Now, before you sit the patient back, you need to make sure that the table is adjusted to 30 degrees. And to do that, you just press down on the lever and approximately put the back of the table at 30 degrees. Then you can lay the patient back and extend the leg rest. Okay, so the first thing we'll do is start up here in the neck. And what we're doing is assessing two different vessels. The first one, the internal jugular vein, which we're using to measure the jugular venous pressure. It's a bit of a misnomer because we're actually measuring the pressure that enters the right atrium using the internal jugular vein itself on the right side. The second vessels that we're looking for are the common carotid arteries on both the left and the right. And um, I'll show you how that works in a second. But um, to begin, what we first want to do is identify the major anatomical landmarks that we'll be using in this phase of the exam. The first one is located at the second intercostal space. And to find it, you need to put your fingers on the sternum itself. So the sternum here, and then move your fingers up until you feel this junction. This is actually a joint between the sternum below and the manubrium above it. So it's called the sternomanubrial junction, or the angle of Louis. So we're using this because right below it, about five centimeters below it, is where the right atrium is found. The second anatomical landmark we need to know is simply the sternocleidomastoid muscle here. So as its name implies, it starts on the sternum and the clavicle, and it courses up to just behind the ear uh, in what's called the mastoid process. So this is important because it demarcates the lateral border of the anterior triangle of the neck, in which both the internal jugular vein and the common carotid arteries live. So to look for the common, or excuse me, the internal jugular vein pulsations, what I'm going to do is shine my pen light just along the surface. This is called tangential lighting. And what you should be able to see is just very minor pulsations occurring uh, on the surface of the skin. So in this area, if you see that, uh, it should be the internal jugular vein that you see. Once you find that pulsation, you'll just course the pen light towards the head until you can no longer see the pulsations. And it's at, lo it's at that location that you want to use your straight edge, which in this case is just a tongue depressor, and make a horizontal line until you reach uh, basically right across the sternum. Once you have that, you'll then drop the ruler uh, using the centimeter side of it uh, to then measure the distance between the horizontal line, your, your straight edge, and the surface of the sternum. So I have here about two centimeters of distance between the bottom of the straight edge and the surface of the sternum. And I would then add two centimeters here uh, to the five centimeters uh, to assess seven centimeters of pressure in the right atrium. Okay, so now moving on to the common carotid arteries. First thing we want to do when assessing this pulse is to first listen. And what we're doing is we're listening for a turbulent blowing type of sound that might occur if there's plaque formation inside of the common carotid arteries. And the reason we do this first is we don't want to palpate and just unlodge any uh, plaques that have formed within this artery. So I'll then use the bell side of the stethoscope because this is a low frequency blowing type of a murmur. And I don't hear it, so we're safe to palpate or feel. So I'm going to again feel within this groove, just medial to the sternocleidomastoid. And what I'm doing here is I'm noting for what's called the amplitude and the contour. The amplitude being the strength of the pulse as I feel beneath my fingers. And secondly, the contour, or the, the way it changes over time. So how quickly it develops and how slowly or quickly it, it diminishes. All right, so and then again on the other side. So if you could look to the right shoulder. So again, we're just going to listen with the bell side of the stethoscope. Okay. And then we'll again palpate on that same area. 
All right, feels good. And that completes the neck portion of the cardiovascular exam. Okay, now that we've finished with the neck exam, before we begin examining the heart itself, what we need to do is first position the patient with appropriate draping. Um, now what I have here is a big blanket, which you'll have access to in all of the rooms. And what you can do with this is just cover the lower part of the patient, like this. And here's where you can actually ask for the, the patient's help. You can ask them to lift up on the gown while you hold the blanket in place. So if you could please do that. Okay. Once you have that, you can then ask the patient to remove her arms from the armholes of the gown, if she can do so. And if she, the patient's not able to do this, you can just unbutton at the snaps on top of the gown. Okay. So what we need to do is access the upper part of the chest, approximately the second intercostal space, which we just found. And then also, you'll need to access the underside at approximately the fifth intercostal space, which you just bring it up to the side of the ribs um, at the very midline. Okay, so this is what's called a bikini drape. And you can even tell the patient that you, you're trying to make a bikini with the gown, so you can access, access both the top and bottom parts of the heart. Okay, so once you have the patient properly draped with the bikini drape above and the blanket situated below, you wanna first take a minute just to inspect the skin uh, around the chest. And what you're looking for, any color changes, notable abnormalities that you can see, uh, but more importantly, you can actually see pulsations on the surface of the skin if the heart is beating uh, very hard. Okay, so once you've taken a minute to inspect the chest, you want to first identify the major landmarks. And for this exam, it's again the second intercostal space, which is demarcated by the uh, sternal angle. This is important because just to the right of it is the aortic valve region, and just to the left of it is the pulmonic valve region. Okay, to find the tricuspid valve, you'll want to then course down two or three, or yeah, about three intercostal spaces uh, to the point of the fifth intercostal space. Just to the left of the sternum is where you can best hear the tricuspid valve. And then finally, to find the mitral valve area, you want to identify what's called the point of maximal impulse, or the PMI. And this is located, again, at the fifth intercostal space, but approximately at the midclavicular line. And in females, what you can do is actually ask for their help in lifting up on the left breast. And this can help you expose that region to then feel within the intercostal spaces uh, to identify where the heart is beating the hardest. That's again the PMI. And once you've identified that, that is approximately where the mitral valve is best heard. Okay, so once I'm done palpating um, those areas of the chest, you want to then listen uh, in those same areas using your stethoscope. And we'll do that using both the bell and the diaphragm sides of the stethoscope. Okay, so starting up at the second intercostal space. We'll listen first in the aortic region. So this is just to the right of the sternum. Secondly, we'll listen on the pulmonic valve region, just to the left. And coursing down to the fifth intercostal space on the left of the sternum, we're listening in the tricuspid area. And then lastly, we'll listen at the point of maximal impulse at the PMI for the mitral valve. And then we would want, then want to repeat it using the diaphragm in those same four locations. All right, so if you're having a hard time finding the point of maximal impulse or the PMI, what you can actually do is rotate the patient onto their left side. And in doing so, you bring the heart against the chest wall, making it easier to feel the PMI itself. Uh, so to do that, what you can do is just ask the patient, would you please rotate on your left side yeah. and put your arm beneath your head? Okay, and what I'm doing here is just holding the blanket uh, on the patient as she rotates. Uh, so like this. Okay, and basically what we're doing is feeling that exact same area and feeling for the strength of the PMI. And once you identify it, you can then use both sides of the stethoscope uh, to listen to the mitral area. Okay, so what I've just shown you completes the heart exam itself. If you hear or suspect that the patient has aortic regurgitation, what you can do is an additional test to make that murmur louder. And so what you can do is have the patient sitting up, uh, again, this time still with the gown unbuckled. And what we're really trying to do with this procedure is 
increase the amount of blood that's flowing back from the aorta into the left ventricle. And to do that, what you can do is have the patient exhale all the way and hold the exhale, and by doing so, actually create a vacuum inside of the chest that can essentially suck blood from the aorta back into the left ventricle if it is regurgitating. Okay, so to show you that, what we can do is, using your stethoscope, listening in the tricuspid area, place your stethoscope at, again, the, the fifth intercostal space, and you can lean the patient forward a little bit, and in doing so, you bring the heart a little bit closer to the chest wall, and you can hear a little better. So we're just gonna have you take a deep breath in, and exhale fully, and then just hold the exhale. Good. Okay, so in doing that, we would have made aortic regurgitation a little bit louder. Okay, so the next component of the cardiovascular exam is the peripheral vascular exam. The first step of that is just to inspect um, the skin. So in, we're just gonna start with the upper extremity. So what I'm doing is just looking for any signs of a vasculopathy, paleness or redness, um, any skin abnormalities that you might take note of. Uh, you want to also just in check both sides, the palms of the hands, the insides of the arms, and everything like that. Um, but don't forget the fingernail beds themselves, uh, because you can find a lot of um, problems that have cardiac origin um, just from looking at the fingernail beds. Okay, so once you've inspected uh, thoroughly, you can then check a couple of pulses in the upper extremities here. The first one I'll show you is the radial artery pulse, and this is found at the wrist on the side of the thumb, right here. And what we're doing when we check every of these, all of these pulses is we're checking the strength of it. We're also checking uh, the rate and the rhythm here. So the rate is just how many beats per minute. And to do that, you can just count how many beats you feel in a 15 second interval and multiply by four. Okay, and the last thing we wanna do at every pulse is check the symmetry, if we can. Uh, so just checking how equal it is on, on both sides of your patient. Okay, once you've done that, we'll check the ulnar artery. And this is found again at the wrist, but this time at the side of the pinky. Okay, and then the last pulse we'll feel is the brachial artery pulse on the upper extremity. And to find this, it's easier if you just push the biceps muscle outside. And in doing so, usually you can reveal the brachial artery beneath it. Okay, so then we'll just go to the lower extremity. Okay, moving to the lower extremities of the peripheral vascular exam. So what you wanna do is have the patient lay back on the table, just extend the leg rest. Once we do, the first thing we'll do again is just to inspect the lower leg itself. What we're looking for, paleness or redness, any skin abnormalities that we can take note of, but we also wanna look for signs of edema, specifically pitting edema. To do that, what you can do is using either your thumb or your index finger, press on the anterior tibia hold it for just a second, and then remove it. And if you see the indentation of your thumb persist over time, that, that is an indication of pitting edema. Okay, so once you've inspected the lower extremity thoroughly, what you can do is start checking a number of pulses. The first pulse I'll show you is what's called the dorsalis pedis pulse. And since you haven't taken MSK yet, what you can do is actually ask the patient to lift up their big toe. This shows a tendon just the outside of that, below this prominent on top of the foot, is a great place to start when feeling for the dorsalis pedis. And again, we're checking for strength, we're making sure that it's equal on both sides. Okay, and, and sometimes this is a weak pulse even in healthy people, and it's hard to feel, particularly if you're pressing too hard. So if you're having trouble feeling this pulse, it may be better to relieve some of the pressure on your finger and then you can sort of reveal that pulse by removing some pressure from it. Okay, so that's the first one. The second one is what's called the posterior tibial artery pulse. So the posterior tibial artery pulse is found just behind or just posterior to what's called the medial malleolus, this prominence on the ankle bone. What we're feeling is between the Achilles tendon and the medial malleolus, right in this area, we're just checking for the pulse there. And again, you'll check for symmetry by checking both of these pulses. Okay, so moving up the leg towards the, the knee, you'll then check the popliteal artery pulse. 
And to do this, um, because it's so deep in the leg, what you can do is cup both hands around the knee like this, and you can actually move some of the structures posterior to the knee around to be able to isolate the popliteal artery. Okay, so just to show you that, you can bend the knee up at the level of the knee, and just kind of by pushing behind the knee, you can isolate the popliteal artery pulse. Okay, and you want to then check on the other side of the knee. You cannot assess symmetry in this case. Okay, so the last pulse we'll assess in the lower extremity is what's called the femoral artery pulse. And this can be a relatively difficult pulse to find uh, because it is at the border between the pelvis and the anterior leg. And an important two landmarks to find are the anterior superior iliac spine, or the ACES, and then also the pubic symphysis, which is at the midline of the pelvis at the lower border of it. Okay, and what actually runs between these two landmarks is another one called the inguinal ligament. And this is just a band of tissue uh, from which the femoral artery emerges into the anterior of the leg, approximately at the midline of it. So what you want to do is just uncover that area of skin. And if you can't really find the region that you're hoping to find the femoral artery at, you can actually have the patient bend their leg at the hip. And in doing so, you can actually cause a crease um, to emerge right here. And at the crease is approximately where the inguinal ligament is located. So feeling just distal to that at the midline, you can usually find the femoral artery. So once you've found that pulse, you would then check the other side of the patient for that same pulse. And that concludes the peripheral vascular exam. So this concludes the cardiovascular exam. Uh, this time you would want to close with the patient by um, summarizing the exam, asking if they have any questions, and thanking them for their time. Okay.